Scott Morris and the uh, the piece I just played is the Sarabande from the unaccompanied flute partita by Bach is BWV 1013 um, it's in my book classical guitar complete volume 2 and I use it uh, in chapter 4 as a way to talk about ornamentation and broke interpretation um, so you know before I get into details uh, you know, as far as specific little ornaments or, you know, any kind of phrasing, anything like that. What I'd like to do is just talk to you very briefly about ornamentation and, you know, why so many people do it in, you know, the, such different ways. Well, the main reason is because it is improvised. Um, the piece isn't improvised, but the ornaments. And if, if you're not sure what I mean by, by ornament, you know, the little trills, things like... It's a little... that stuff. Um, that's what I'm talking about. That's not actually in the score. Um, so, you know, what, what players do is they improvise, but we improvise from a list of ornaments that we know were used at the time due to, you know, you know scholars who have looked at treatises, um, you know, J.S. Bach has his own table of ornaments uh, that is very useful. I've actually, I've got the whole thing in, in my book in Chapter 4. Um, but, you know, then there's some other controversial issues, you know, such as, you know, on a string instrument like the guitar, should we stick to just, you know, string type ornaments, you know, lute, violin, or, you know, keyboard ornaments, you know, what, what, what should it be? So, you know, people get real hot under the collar about this, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to pretend to, uh, you know, or even try to, you know, have the final word on any of this uh, because, you know, I know a lot of people have strong feelings one way or the other, but, you know, I just want to give my two cents and uh, if nothing else, uh, a good jumping off point for somebody who's just starting to look at this and then you can develop your own opinions later. Um, so, first off, in the uh, Baroque period, so Bach, of course, was a Baroque composer, um, it was considered standard practice to improvise um, these little embellishments, these little ornaments uh, in the score. And again, sometimes they're notated, sometimes you have like a little mark for a trill or a mordant, something like that, but more often than not, you don't. Um, what I'd like to do here is just go through and give you just a handful of basic ornaments that you can use to begin to do this. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the trill, and there are a couple of different types of trill I'd like to show you. Um, the mordant, and uh, you know maybe an appoggiatura or two as well. So the first uh, the first ornament I'd like to look at here um, is is the trill. We're actually going to look at a couple of trills. I'm going to show you a few different ways um, to uh, to approach these. The first one is in is in measure six, and let me play the measure one time without uh, the ornament. Um, you just have three chords, quarter notes. It's real simple. So one, two, three. So that's what's written. Now there's an ornament on beat two. So on this chord, there's a little squiggly above. That means trill. When you do a trill in the Baroque period, you want to trill from the upper auxiliary note. So you want to trill, if it's say E, um, the note before is F, so you start your trill on that F and then resolve it down to the E. Um, so this is a short trill, so a short trill will generally be, you know, four to six or so notes. So, you know, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, five, six, um, there. So here, here's how it sounds with the trill. Now the other thing I do to resolve the trill is as it moves into this chord here, I anticipate the resolution with that D there. So you'll hear that I play the D early and then I restrike it. And then into the next measure. Now, in 
measure eight, we have a, a similar sort of thing. We have our quarter notes. And there's a trill again on beat two. Now here, we have an E on beat one, that's in the melody here. And then it's moving to D in the melody here, and then down to C. So what I've decided to do here is, instead of you know doing some sort of funny, you know, up here there's no way to really grab that chord, um, and do a single string trill, so I sort of opted for what's called a cross string trill. A cross string trill um, is, is essentially a trill between two usually adjacent strings, as opposed to a single string trill, that first one I did, that's a single string trill, or you know, single string trill. A cross string trill sounds a little bit more like something you do on a keyboard, it's like a keyboard type trill. Um, so I do this trill, there, so I'm going back and forth between E on the first string and D on the second string. Um, in my book I also give a couple of the standard, you know, fingerings, you got a couple of choices here for cross string trill. You kind of want to do whatever's most comfortable, but there are some considerations um, that I should mention. Um, the most, I think, successful fingering, right hand fingering for the cross string trill is, is this one. So again, going back and forth between the first string and the second string. A, I, M, I. A, I, M, I. Just make a little exercise out of that. Practice some little bursts, things like that, just to you know get them nice and fluttery there. Um, that's good because the I finger um, won't over accent the note with the trill. Um, you know, theoretically, you want to play the upper note louder, and then the note, uh, the lower note, a little bit quieter. It's the you know the tension and the resolution. Um, so that A I M I is great because you know. That. Now there's another trill that's that's really popular. Um, it's it's this fingering. So A I M P. That one's really popular because it, it almost feels a little bit like a tremolo. So you know people can get that going really fast. Um, one of the things uh, I used to do that type of trill all the time. But uh, you know when I was a student. Um, you know, I went to uh, the Aspen Music Festival, you know, four or five years or so in a row, and uh, you know, to work with Sharon Ispin on on Baroque interpretation, and she she really didn't like that trill, and the reason was it's really hard to control the thumb. We tend to over accent, so we end up accenting the note that should be the resolution. So she always sort of said, no, don't do that with the thumb. You know, stick to the A I M I instead of. So, but you know, if you can control your thumb, um, you know, then that's I suppose fine. But it's something you need to be aware of. Um, you know, other people will just you know go back and forth like M I M I M I M I or you know index thumb, wh whatever works. But uh, usually a, a combination of more than two fingers is is, is better because they need to be pretty fast. Um, okay, so you know there you have your two basic trills: so single, single string trills um, as well as cross string trills. Um, the, the next mordant I'd like to um, you point out here is the, or the next ornament is the, the mordant. Mordants are real simple. You know, a mordant, um, you can see those in my book, um, again in, in chapter four, exercise 4.7. I'll just play a basic one here um, in measure one. So what's actually written, measure one, is this. Okay, so on beat three there, it's just written eighth note, eighth note, the next measure. What I do is that. So there's a little more, it's kind of like a half trill, um, and you can do what's either, you know, an upper mordant or a lower mordant. This is a lower mordant. So, um, the note's A, so I just go A, G sharp, A, really fast. Right, and I, I throw those in all over the place here. Um, so, you know, mordants are, are, are nice. I look mostly for, you know, half steps, things like that. So, you know, hear that G sharp, to the A, little half step. So it sounds nice.
cross-string more to there. So, you know, you can cross-string those as well if you like. But, you know, more than like a half trill, again, so usually three notes, um, usually, you know, down a half step and then back to where you were. And, uh, you know, lots of opportunities for those as well. Um, you know, a couple other things you might want to think about. Uh, you, you, there's something called an appoggiatura, which is an accented dissonance. So, you know, you know a good place to do that. Um, you know, if I start here. Right here, instead of playing the note written, which is that B, I might play a C, the note above. So let me put that in context for you. What's written that, but what I do is I play that C in its place, so the, the note above, and then resolve it. You accent the note that you're adding, and you take it away. Um, it, it, it literally translates a positive as lean, so you're going to lean on this note, and then you're going to resolve. Right? So now, don't do this. Right? You're you're accenting the wrong note. So accent the dissonance, and then resolve. there. So lots of opportunities uh, to do this. And the reason I chose the Sarabande here is because with a slower movement, if this was, you know, the courant or, you know, you know, Bourree or Jig or something like that, one of the faster dances, you, you don't have quite as much room, um, as much space to, to improvise these little embellishments. That's why Sarabands are a great place to start with these, uh, with, with this, uh, you know, type of performance practice. Now, just a couple other suggestions here. Um, it, you know, it is important to understand the academic stuff, um, you know, because the fact of the matter is, you know, musicologists and, and you know, well-informed players have actually done research. They've gone and, you know, looked at these old treatises and, you know, we know, um, even though they're, they're improvised, we know what they were doing because they wrote a lot about what they did. As I mentioned, even Bach had, a, had a, an ornament table. So, you know, hardly any treatises are without ornament tables at this time. They're all over the place. So we know tons about what they did. Um, but it's one thing to understand, you know, technically, you know, start, you know, the trill on the upper note, you know, a mordant is this, you know, an appoggiatore is that, and there are tons of others as well. Um, you know, there's some great books out there, um, you know, such as, you know, the, the, the Frederick Newman, um, which just give you tons and tons and tons of different uh, ornaments. I just want to give you a few here. But it's one thing to understand academically exactly what to do, but you also have to have it in your ear. And uh, for that reason, I just recommend that you listen to, you know, a lot of great players uh, playing Baroque music. There, there are so many, you know, wonderful recordings out there um, with, uh, you know, fantastic ornamentation. Um, just, you know, just off the top of my head, um, you know, Bill Cannon Geyser on uh, Rondo Walla Turca, the Handel uh, piece that he has there, you know, brilliant ornamentation. Sharon Isbin's complete lute suites, fantastic. David Russell plays Bach, um, you know, unbelievable. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of opportunities to, to listen. I think, you know, just immerse yourself in it and get it in your ear. Um, also, listen to lute players, listen to keyboardists, listen to, you know, string players, um, you know, depending on what you're playing. This is a flute piece, so, you know, listen to a lot of flute. Um, you know, wonderful performances by, by famous flutists in order to uh, kind of get that in my ear here. Of course, you know, you make it a guitar piece uh, by, you know, adding harmony and things like that, uh, which, uh, which I'll come back to in just, just a moment. But, you know, my, my point is, um, get it in your ear, listen to it, so then, you know, you kind of have a feel for it rather than just an academic understanding of it. Because you remember, you know, the, the job of the you know classical musician when you're playing old music is not to make it a museum piece but to you know bring it to life you know in the current you know you're making it come alive now you're not staring at an old statue or something it needs to sound you know like it's happening now and uh, you know you can't be too stodgy in your interpretation 
Um, you know, finally, what I'd like to do is just uh, acknowledge uh, the, the help that uh, James Tyler, uh, the, uh, the great lute player and uh, early music scholar at USC, um, who for years ran the early music uh, consort there, um, his help with this partita, I've actually arranged the, the, the whole partita, the flute partita, uh, 1013. So you know, I'd like to acknowledge uh, his help with uh, you know, coming up with this, this, this harmony and continual line. Because again, it's for unaccompanied flutes, so you have to add some things here. Um, and he, he passed a couple of years ago, so definitely wanted to acknowledge that and uh, his help and influence. Well, I hope you got something out of this. I know there's a lot of information. It can get pretty complicated, but uh, you know, like I said, uh, just just know, you know, it's improvised. Listen to a lot of great players, so you can kind of hear what you know what ornaments are there, and you know, start with just a couple. You start with some trills, some mordants. Don't try to you know do the whole kitchen sink thing um, right off the top. Just a few, get a feel for it, and then kind of go from there. I hope to see you in future videos. Thanks. <laughs>